We've published a measure of brief family crisis. We've published a brief family distress scale before. Um, we developed this scale when we were in the psych when I was working in a psychiatric unit um, uh, out of the crisis literature because we realized that families in crisis can't go in and fill out a 100-item parental stress index to to measure crisis if we want to say, are you are you experiencing crisis right now, right? Uh, so we wanted to see, can we even have a single single question right where you are right now in terms of these face valid kind of examples right on here from one everything is fine my family are not in crisis at all to 10 we are currently in crisis and it cannot get any worse right so it's just one item right so so the 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 psychometric kind of people who love psychometrics in the crowd hate this right because it's just one item but it's we thought could it be a useful tool to quickly get a sense from as a clinician if a family filled this out before i was seeing them could i say okay i know you're okay you said you're at a nine right now i'm going to approach you differently than if you're coming in with at a three right as a family here my assumptions under what you're experiencing at this moment as a, just a gross level for further inquiry is going to start off at a different place and maybe we can we can start off then in a more collaborative space um, now that we have the same expectations okay of, of why you're here of what you really need in the moment so it's like a calibration when we uh, asked uh, over 100 families of youth with ASD to fill this out, uh, at where were they in this, just from the community, so not people who are coming in or affiliated with the psychiatric uh, center, um, this was the, the distribution of scores from, the, the, from that not in crisis at all to it could not get any worse. And really interesting kind of profile of this distribution where the most common kind of um, uh, the most common ones were around things are often stressful, but we are managing to deal with problems when they arise, or things are very stressful, but we're getting by with a lot of effort. And I think that that really resonated with me in terms of what actually is the reality for many families uh, who are in our community, right? With people with AS, helping people with this ASD. There is also this little bump that happens kind of at the higher end. Isn't that interesting, right? This, uh, this piece here, almost nobody answered we won't be able to handle things soon. If one more things go wrong, we will be in crisis. It was almost, uh, uh, we have to work extremely hard every moment of every day to avoid a crisis to we are currently in crisis and it cannot get any worse. Right? But it's interesting that we had this other small group here that really was this crisis message. Right? And in fact, when you look at differences in other variables between those two groups, there are considerable significant differences, um, including things like rates of hospitalization, emergency department use, as well as perceived family stress or perceived parental stress, things that you would expect to happen in those two kind of groups. You know, I mentioned positive families, and there is a study that, was, that we published recently in, um, in Autism Research, I believe when it was still co-edited by Dr. Bailey, or edited by Dr. Bailey at the time, um, uh, that, uh, that we tried to kind of do a little test of, can we actually see different pathways between the stressor that a child experiences and their anxiety? And could that pathway be moderated by uh, the level of parental affect, essentially, or parental stress? That is, that is reported by the parent about parenting, okay? Said in another way, we want to see whether par uh, a parent reports of their affect could actually dictate whether kids who experience bullying have different outcomes, okay? So we had kind of three slopes, essentially, three groups that we created from this survey. We asked parents about their kids with, these are kids with ASD, about their bullying victimization, right? From he or she has not been bullied at all over here, right? All the way to two or more times a week in the last, uh, this was in the last two months, okay? So kids vary tremendously. Some kids didn't experience any bullying, um, others kind of chronic frequent bullying, right? And then we measured, we had them report on the, the level of anxiety, okay? And we had them report on the level or express their, 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 their positive and negative affect. Okay? And what I'm showing you here is a visual of it that we see kind of three slopes. So you can see here this kind of gold yellow slope. I don't know what color it is to you. To me, it's, to me it's gold. But we don't have to debate what color it is. Um, it's not like that dress, you know, that, that made the internet. So uh, you can see here there are three slopes. This gold slope is kind of the group that had parents who expressed the lowest level of positive affect, okay? Or the highest level of, of negative stress related to parenting. Right? And as the kids had more frequent bullying, we see the level of child anxiety truly increasing. There's a high slope here, okay? 
In blue is the group of, of families where the parents reported the highest level of positive affect, right? The most relative to that lowest group, okay? It's not that the low group was all negative, it's just relative to that group. Whoop. Um, where am I? Okay. And what you see here is that it has a very different slope, okay? That these two groups, that the groups that had low or moderate or medium kind of levels of positive affect, as there was more bullying, still, there's still an increase. Kids still had lots of stress, right? That is, the parents' reporting of their affect didn't stop the effect of bullying, okay? It didn't stop it from actually impacting, say, or stop it from potentially being related to anxiety, I should say, in the kids. Those are still related. But the, there was a different path depending on the level of warmth or parental affect that was the type or the level that was expressed. Does that make sense? So parental warmth, and this is not just in the ASD literature, parental and as well, not although we didn't study it, sibling warmth in typically developing children who have been uh, peer, uh, bullied, right, is, has been shown to be a moderator of the effects of that two and four years after experiences of victimization. Right? So family warmth and positive family environments really does matter. So intervening with families matters, supporting families. This is not about blaming families or putting the, all the responsibility on families. It's about creating policies and services that help the child, but also treat the family when they ask for it. Okay? So things like acceptance and commitment therapy workshops have been shown to be effective in changing um, uh, parenting stress in, in uh, parents of kids with developmental disabilities. Mindful parenting that, that Singh has used and others have used, um, the My Mind program that, 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 I'm, uh, that we're running with NeuroDevNet has shown, uh, is on that as well. Elizabeth Dykins published an, a great study in pediatrics recently where she, she trained parents to be the therapists. Okay? for other parents of children with developmental disabilities in two interventions. It wasn't even a weightless control. She trained some parents to provide a mindfulness-based stress reduction and other parents to provide a positive empowerment support. So a positive psychology, still a very positive support group, okay? And they, and they randomized parents to both a lar very large sample. And they essentially showed that both of the groups are helpful. Right, to the families who participate in it, but that there's a slightly uh, faster effect with the, the mindfulness kind of approach than the other one, and frankly, that those parents who had children with ASD um, had slower or less gains than families, uh, parents of children with other developmental disabilities who participated. But everybody seemed to benefit. But what was really cool is, this is part that I know, one of the first studies to train parents to be kind of the facilitators of these groups for other parents. And they didn't have a condition where they had just therapists who were uh, clinicians doing it. And that would be really interesting to see the, the difference there. But the point is that all of these are different ways of providing supports to families. And it's not that one is better than the other. In fact, we probably need a suite of different options for families to fit their unique context. Some families, logistically, can come on Saturdays and Sundays for a workshop. Other families can't. They could come after school once a week. Some families need an uh, individual work, one-on-one -on -one or with their family. Others really would benefit from a social or a group environment. The point is, is, is just that. If we're going to tailor things to the unique individual, we need to tailor them to the unique family. Okay. So those are the kinds of things I'm talking about when I'm speaking, when I'm saying mindful, mindfulness or for parents or for families. Okay.